In the top stories, oncology unit opened at JNF Hospital. PM Harris announces overtime pay for medical personnel and Mental Health Day Treatment Center hailed as a major accomplishment. The details on these stories and more after the break. Hello and welcome to the Zarazer Channel 5 newscast. I'm Carla Barrage. Significant strides continue to be made in local health care, this time in the opening of an oncology unit at the Joseph and Franz General Hospital. More in this report. Prime Minister Dr. The Honorable Timothy Harris cut the ribbon on the newly handed over oncology unit on Tuesday in the presence of government officials and cancer care stakeholders. The unit is expected to offer locals affordable specialized treatment for any type of cancer and bring relief to cancer patients who will no longer have to travel overseas for treatment. This is according to Chief Surgeon and Medical Chief of Staff Dr. Cameron Wilkinson, who said the establishment of this unit will help persons to live longer. Today, the opening of the Oncology Center at the Joseph and France Hospital signals the dawn of a new and brighter day for cancer care in the Federation of St. Kitts and Nevis. This center will add years to the lives of people living with cancer. This center will ensure that breadwinners and families not simply succumb to their disease, but continue their active lives while they receive the appropriate and timely treatment. This center will ensure that no one will die because they could not afford to travel overseas for treatment. Minister of State with Responsibility for Health, Honorable Wendy Phipps, said today marks a new era in the delivery of health care in the Federation and, in particular, the treatment of non-communicable diseases. Our response here in St. Kitts and Nevis is evident in the opening of the Oncology Center, in the increased budgetary allocations that have been given to the procurement of oncology drugs, largely through the support of the OECS pool procurement on pharmaceuticals, and for those drugs that will not be available there from the PAHO pool procurement system that we will be accessing at the same time. Minister of Health Honorable Eugene Hamilton said success in cancer care does not depend on any one entity. He recognized the doctors and nurses at the hospital as well as the cancer support groups within the Federation who continue to assist cancer patients. Our success depends not only on competent staffing and an adequate core budget but also on partnerships with organizations whose cause it is to prevent cancer and to support affected persons. And so on this note, I wish to recognize the efforts of all of the cancer support groups of which I'm aware. The Reach for Recovery, Essence of Hope, Pink Lily, Breast Cancer Support Foundation, and the most recent, a Time for Us Foundation. Prime Minister Dr. The Honorable Timothy Harris said the opening of the oncology unit is another important development in healthcare in the Federation. Today's opening is not just good news for those who are involved in healthcare delivery, it is good news for the patients and their families. Another important development in healthcare delivery right here in St. Kitts and Nevis. Universal healthcare becoming available to all the people of St. Kitts and Nevis. And it's happening not out there. It is happening here in the land of our birth. The oncology unit will be fully staffed with an oncologist, specialist nurses, and an oncology pharmacist. The unit will be opened daily and there will be a weekly oncology clinic at the outpatient department at JNF General Hospital. Treatment for patients with illnesses such as breast cancer, colon cancer, prostate cancer, thyroid cancer and several leukemias will begin as early as this week. The opening of the oncology unit follows on the heels of the opening of the Mental Health Day Treatment Center which took place on Monday. Reporting for ZIZ News, I'm Carla Barrage. 
Prime Minister Dr. The Honorable Timothy Harris has announced that preparations have been made for medical personnel to receive overtime payments. This comes ahead of the Prime Minister's 2017 budget address. Some of us in healthcare and in other sectors believe that we are overworked and underpaid, and some of you are, I admit. And in the 2017 budget, we are going to make a special provision for nurses and other healthcare people to get overtime payment. To God be the glory. Long overdue, but better late than never. Prime Minister Harris was at the time addressing the gathering at the opening of the oncology unit at the Joseph N. France General Hospital on Tuesday. Prime Minister Dr. The Honorable Timothy Harris has described the completion of the Mental Health Day Treatment Center as a major accomplishment for community health services. The center was officially handed over to government on Monday, and during the ceremony, the Prime Minister noted the significance of having that type of facility in the Federation. This is not only the first such center in the Federation, but also in the wider OECS. We are therefore creating a wonderful legacy, and we are making a beautiful history. The project cost around $1.3 million, with the government providing about $1.2 million. The Prime Minister said this is an indication of the government's commitment to providing support for mental health care. Because we were committed to health care, because we understand that our people need this support, that the country must show its concern to those who are vulnerable, those who are stigmatized in our communities, we determine that we will find the funds to bring it to successful completion. The aim of the center is to use rehabilitative treatments to ultimately reintegrate patients back into society. The police are investigating an incident in Sandy Point where a gun was accidentally fired during a fight. According to a police source, two men were engaged in a struggle at a friend's home in Fig Tree. One of the men took out a gun and hit the other man, accidentally firing one round. No one was shot during the incident. Investigations are ongoing. After the break, Minister Liburd outlines numerous benefits from a second cruise pair and regional statisticians meet in St. Kitts to discuss quality assurance. We'll tell you more when we come back. Tuesday was Prime Minister Harris's birthday and throughout the day he has been receiving greetings and salutations from friends, family and other well-wishers. On the weekend, the Prime Minister attended a special church service where constituents and other supporters wished him a happy birthday. I want to thank you sincerely from the bottom of my heart for the love, for the loyalty and the strong support that you have given me over the last 20 plus years that I have been a member of parliament starting way back in 1993. This constituency has been very loving and very caring and has taught me of to love better, how to care more. And I say from the bottom of my heart, it is a deep honor and privilege to have been able to serve you and to receive always your overwhelming support. Certainly I feel honored by the privilege to have my constituents with me as often they, as they have been but more particularly at this moment as I celebrate my own birthday to have them share this special occasion with me. My constituents are very special and they have shown me much love, much loyalty. They have been the source of my inspiration and even in difficult moments, they have always been there for me. And so I would want as often as I can 
to be with and among my constituents. I would like to wish our Honourable Prime Minister, the Doctor, the Honourable Timothy Harris, a very, very happy birthday. He has been doing so much for this country even before becoming Prime Minister and we know that he will do so much more for our country and the development of the people of our country. I would like to take this opportunity to wish our dear beloved Prime Minister congratulations on his birthday and I ask that the Lord will continue to bless him and keep him. I would like to wish the best Prime Minister in the whole wide world, Dr. the Right Honorable Timothy Harris, happy birthday, long life and happiness. I would like to say a happy birthday to the best Prime Minister. I fully support him in everything that he does and I wish, I wish that he see many, many more birthdays to come. Minister of Public Infrastructure, the Honorable Ian Lybert, has emphasized the direct and spin-off benefits of a new cruise ship pier. During the St. Christopher Air and Seaport Authority's press conference on Monday to address the construction of a second cruise pier, he noted that the new and enhanced ports would accommodate larger cruise ships. As the new and larger vessels come aligned, the new enhanced ports will capture the itinerary calls leaving the existing older ships to continue servicing the less equipped ports and of course a second cruise pier will position St. Kitts to be the recipient of those larger cruise vessels. Minister Leibert said this development would not only affect SCASPA but it would also have an impact on the grassroots economy. This development and development of SCASPA or SCASPA's infrastructure is not about SCASPA. It is about the national consideration. Because when we assess the benefit of the second pier to the country as a whole and approach it as a necessary national infrastructure and not just a pier, because we are aware of the impact that such a development has on what they call the grassroots economy. Minister Leibert said more passengers will create opportunities for employment and self-employment of kitchens and divisions, and that there will be an increased earning of foreign exchange and an opportunity to showcase St. Kitts Nevis for return land-based visits. He added that there will be an increased purchase of real estate and promotion of the citizenship by investment program. Minister Leibert said the second cruise pier project has full support of the cabinet. Statisticians from 14 CARICOM countries are in the Federation attending a workshop aimed at developing a regional data quality assurance framework. The workshop, which runs from Monday, December 5th to Friday, December 9th, is facilitated by Statistics Canada in collaboration with the local Department of Statistics. Carlton Phipps, Director of Statistics, said the workshop is extremely important to St. Kitts and Nevis and the region on a whole, noting that meaningful lessons will be taken away for use in various statistics departments in the region. This workshop is very important as we seek to advance statistics in the region and within St. Kitts Nevis. The aim or the objective behind this is to build credibility and quality statistics and uh, the framework in which we're working on or developing is to strengthen our statistics within the region. Roland Boudreau, Director, Economic Statistics Division of Statistics Canada, said they are grateful to be able to facilitate the workshop as it is their role to facilitate the building up of the framework. The idea here is really to uh, try and bring uh, all together the experience of all the countries, uh, share uh, this, this experience and try and come up with the original perspective on the quality assurance framework. Really what we're looking at is uh, to come up with a good uh, draft document of the quality assurance framework which then will be reviewed and uh, validated by uh, member countries, CARICOM as well, so and you know that's up to the region to, to 
bring it to the uh, final version of the document. The Government of Canada is funding a new statistical capacity building initiative for the Caribbean region, namely the project for the regional advancement of statistics in the Caribbean. The project, which cost 19.5 million Canadian dollars, aims to strengthen the statistical system of the Caribbean in order to improve socio-economic measures and support evidence-based policy making. Coming up, Barbados now offers lifelong antiretroviral therapy for persons living with HIV. The details when we come back. Anyone diagnosed with HIV in Barbados will now be eligible for lifelong antiretroviral therapy from the early stage. We hear more in this report. There are no longer any limitations on who can access antiretroviral treatment for HIV in Barbados. This was revealed by Minister of Health John Boyce on Monday as he announced that Barbados was now following the World Health Organization's Treat All approach, which was announced in 2015. The WHO recommends that treatment be made available for anyone infected with HIV, regardless of which stage the virus is at. In January 2016, the Ministry of Health decided to adopt the treatment treat all approach, in which all persons with HIV will be offered lifelong therapy, irrespective of their CD4 count. We came to this decision based on the results of a study conducted in collaboration with the Caribbean Regional Office of the U.S. Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. Interestingly, the study, which was called, called a cost-benefit analysis looking at the early initiation of antiretroviral therapy in Barbados, was conducted before the WHO made their announcement about treat up. So we anticipated and thought that we should get in there early with our, our, our program. The statistical model used showed the cost of providing treatment to all persons with HIV, not based on clinical criteria, and what the public health impact would be in terms of the number of new infections averted due to wiser, wider use of antiretroviral therapy. We presented this case to the Ministry of Finance, who re readily realized that starting treat all would be an investment which would reduce health care costs in Barbados in the long term. They have approved additional funding to the tune of some $500,000 for the current financial year, and this will be rolled over, of course, into our new financial year come April 2017. Coming up, East Aleppo struggles to bury the dead. The details when we return. <laughs> Rebel-held East Aleppo is struggling to deal with its dead. The cemeteries are full and bodies are being buried in public places like parks. It's a gruesome, heart-wrenching search. Looking for a missing loved one, they have to open each body bag. They move into another room where more bodies lie. They're looking for their uncle. They don't find him. When we find him, we'll bury him. You can hear the sound of the jets. It never stops. There's no bread or food or water. And with all these issues, there's the constant bombs and jets. As you see, this place is full of bodies. It's hard to recognize them because many of their faces are deformed. Some of the dead are brought here to a makeshift morgue. There is no electricity, no refrigerator to preserve the bodies. The now biting cold winter, only a blessing for the dead. 
Khaled Kalaji has the grim job of looking after the bodies. They just keep coming. When they bring the bodies here, we take picture of them and then we document them. Families come here to look through the picture we have, or they actually search the bodies, looking for a missing loved one. There is little dignity in death here. Whoever lies inside this bag will be pulled by hand to their final resting place. While this was being filmed, there were several airstrikes. What's striking about this footage that we've received from the rebel-held part of Aleppo is that in almost every single clip, you can hear the constant roar of jets in the sky. Now, they filmed this for us in various different neighborhoods, so it gives you an indication of just how relentless the bombardment is. The cemeteries filled up a long time ago, so now the dead are being buried in parks or wherever there is space. For those who died because of the heavy bombardment, and there are too many, there are no cemeteries to bury them. The humanitarian situation inside the city is really bad. These three have not yet been identified and will be temporarily buried under sand, so their bodies can be easily retrieved to allow their families to give them a proper farewell. That's if they are ever found. Hundreds of thousands have been killed in this war, and more are dying every day. Stephanie Decker, Al Jazeera, Gaziantep, on the Turkey-Syria border. Up next in sports, Trinidad football official lays out what he thinks are the keys to the national team's success and Vaja Federer out of competitive tennis until next year. Stay tuned. Trinidad's former national team captain Clayton Morris has outlined key areas that are necessary for success. He said the country's next senior men's head coach needs to be experienced, versed in the sporting culture and the resources needed to get a team to the World Cup will have to begin flowing more freely. After, after we get a recommendation, it will go to the board for approval and hopefully within the next 72 to 96 hours, we will have an announcement on who's the new national coach. Still no word today on who the new national team coach will be from the TTFA. Despite TTFA President David John Williams saying last Thursday, one will be named soon. Today, the official word from the organization is that there is still no decision. Former strike squad captain Clayton Morris believes the decision might have proven difficult so far because of the qualities the next coach must possess. You need somebody with that experience. You have to get somebody who have been, you know, have been there, as we say, who have been there and done that. Again, you still have to get somebody who could, could really understand our culture and who could, who the players could adapt to us. And, you know, as I said, we don't, we don't have much time, you know, so it's, it's, it's really, really a challenge. And I still feel, you know, we've taken too long to, to put that, um, at least that the person so that, you know, the public and all could, could, but it's so okay team and, you know, and, and most of the players. Morris stressed this new coach will also need to be supplied with whatever resources are deemed necessary. You know, we could look at America and say America fired a coach, but America, they will give or they give the coach all that he asks for and even more. And if you fail, then they, 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 they replace you. Mm -hmm. But in Canada, they go to give you a quota of what you ask for uh, or even... You know, and, and, and they expect you to get results. So this is one of the things, you know, definitely if a, a, a top foreign coach come here, he would, he would demand all these things because that is what it takes to get the, to get the job done. Kent Fuentes, Sea Sports. Roger Federer will not return from a knee injury until the new year, having pulled out of International Premier Tennis League, IPTL, because of uncertainties surrounding the event. 
The 35-year-old Swiss has not played since the Wimbledon semi-final defeat by Milos Raonic in late July. World number two Serena Williams has also withdrawn from the IPTL. This year's tournament features one fewer team than last year and has been undermined by financial difficulties. Federer, a 17-time Grand Slam champion, is expected to be fit for January's Australian Open. A sheriff in Louisiana is defending the investigation of a man who fatally shot ex-NFL player Joe McKnight during a road rage dispute. Authorities say the shooter, Ronald Gasser, was taken into custody, questioned and released after the killing last Thursday. Been already accused of dropping the ball, of doing this and doing that because we released Mr. Gasser uh, last evening. Jefferson Parish Sheriff Newell Normand drew heated criticism for allowing suspect Ronald Gasser's release after the killing of ex-NFL player Joe McKnight last Thursday. Gasser was taken into custody, questioned, and released. On Tuesday, a day after Gasser was arrested and charged with manslaughter, the sheriff said Gasser had been released for strategic investigative reasons and because authorities needed to talk to witnesses. The sheriff angrily said his department had been unfairly criticized, and he said the tone of some of the comments were outrageous. He read some of the criticisms aloud and slammed his fist on the podium a couple of times, showing his frustration with some demands of immediate justice. When we come back, we'll have another look at the stories that made the headlines. Recapping the top stories, oncology unit opened at JNF Hospital, Prime Minister Harris announces overtime pay for medical personnel, and Mental Health Day Treatment Center hailed as a major accomplishment. And that's the end of the Zellizer Channel 5 newscast. Thank you for joining us. I'm Carla Barrage. Goodbye.